for the parasternal short axis, you're using the same window as the parasternal long axis. The difference is that the indicator is now pointed 90 degrees differently. So it's going to point up towards the left shoulder or the right hip, depending on what your machine looks like. And you're going to see a circular looking heart, like a donut. The left ventricle will be like a circle and the right ventricle will be on top, sort of triangular shape. And depending on how you angle your probe, you can see different things. Of Usually right in the middle is where we see the mitral valve. And then if we angle the probe up towards the root of the heart or up towards the patient's head, a little bit higher, you can see the uh, aortic valve right in the middle. It's a three leaflet valve, so it often looks like a Mercedes Benz sign. And then you can usually see the tricuspid valve and the right atrium, right ventricle wrapping around the left side of the heart. Pulmonic valve may also be viewable in this uh, at this angle. And then as you shoot the ultrasound more towards the feet, you'll pass the mitral valve again, and you can see then the very uh, apex of the heart. So here's a example of a personal long axis, and this is a patient that has heart failure. So you can see the left ventricle like a circle, like a donut, and the mitral valve is here in the middle. You can tell the mitral valve is not opening well. You can see that the muscle is not squeezing very well either. On the top left of the left ventricle is the interventricular septum, and the right ventricle is past that. And there is a tiny pericardial effusion on this patient as well. You can see it mostly on the bottom part of the image. So I mentioned one thing you can do is look at the right-sided pressures of the heart. Now we're not gonna do any calculations. This is a real critical patient. We're just doing a quick scan to try to figure out what's going on. So here we have a parasternal short axis view. It's kind of switching between an almost apical four chamber and a parasternal short axis. But you have the left ventricle right here, and you notice that it doesn't really look like a donut anymore. It doesn't look like a circle. Instead, it looks like the letter D because the septum is being flattened by the right side of the heart. So we can see that the right side of the heart pressure is acutely elevated. And that's gonna happen from a pulmonary embolism. It could happen from pulmonary hypertension or right ventricular failure, there's a whole bunch of reasons. But for the patient that's dying, pulmonary embolism is at the top of our list. So remember the D sign. That left ventricle should look like a circle, not the letter D. Another example here, left ventricle on the bottom, you can just see how that uh, right ventricle on top, much bigger than the left ventricle, right? So the chamber uh, size is quite different abnormal and also the pressure in there is quite high because it's moving that septum into the left ventricle. Let's talk about the apical four chamber. This view is great for assessing the chamber sizes comparing the right and left sides of the heart and also uh, good for looking at the mitral tricuspid and aortic valves. We're not going to talk too much about valve dysfunction here. That's really suited for a whole separate lecture. In the apical four chamber, you're shooting from the apex of the heart and you're trying to get all four chambers. And the idea is that the left ventricle should always be larger than the right ventricle. If the right ventricle is larger than the left, then something is wrong with the heart. Now you can see left and right heart, left and right ventricle, left and right atrium, commonly the mitral and tricuspid valves. And then if you point the ultrasound a little bit more anterior in the chest, you can often see the aortic valve as well. Now that thing that the arrow is pointing to here is called the moderator band. It's a part of the right ventricular muscle that's in the apex of the heart. Sometimes when you're doing this ultrasound, you may get confused what's the left and what's the right heart, especially if the chamber sizes are abnormal. So look for that moderator band. And that is a telltale sign that that's the right ventricle. Other things are that the tricuspid valve is a little bit closer to the apex of the heart than the mitral valve. So that's another clue. And then in a normal heart, the left ventricle should be more muscular as well. So here's a nice normal apical four chamber. Left ventricle is on the right side of the image. Right ventricle is on the left side of the image. You can see that the left ventricle is much larger than the right ventricle. And you can see the atrium as well, side by side. Mitral and tricuspid valves, a little bit of the aortic valve in the middle below the interventricular septum and coming off of the left ventricle. So another picture of how we're getting this image from the apex of the heart. You can see that the indicator, that yellow dot of the probe, is pointed towards the patient's shoulder, left shoulder.
and gives you this nice apical floor chamber. And remember, we're comparing chamber sizes in this view, still looking for pericardial effusions. And you can really assess those valves nicely as well. So here, uh, left ventricle, much larger than the right, no problem there. You can see the moderator band nicely in this image. You can see how the tricuspid valve is closer to the apex of the mitral valve. You just get a sense that the muscle's squeezing well, the valves are opening nicely, chamber sizes look appropriate, no pericardial effusion. This image is much different. You have a really muscular left ventricle, but even with that, the right ventricle is larger or the same size as the right ventricle. The right ventricle should not be any larger than two thirds the size of the left ventricle. Also the right atrium also looks quite large. So it's just the pressures in that right side of the heart are abnormal, they're high, so something's going on. Again, left ventricle here with a really large right ventricle and right atrium. Here's an overgained image, so too bright, but you can see that there's a little pericardial fusion on the top. And then at the apex of the heart, top of the image, almost looks like there's a little person jumping on a trampoline there. That's a, something called a McConnell sign. It can indicate um, right ventricular failure, could indicate pericardial tamponade in the right setting. So you should be worried about some sort of obstructive shock pattern if you see that. Here's some different hearts, and you've seen maybe one of these images before. Let's just go through this. A left image to review is a peristeral long axis, large pericardial effusion surrounding that heart, and you should be concerned for tamponade in that patient. On the right top image, huge pericardial effusion, but now we're in an apical four chamber view. And also we should be worried about pericardial tamponade here. Left lower image looks quite abnormal. It's a little bit maybe dark if you've been looking at these overgained images, but the right side of the heart is actually this, the right ventricle that is, is the big chamber in this view. And it's just huge. That is a massive right ventricle should be really concerned for pulmonary embolism in this patient if they, uh, if they are acutely ill. And then the right bottom image you've seen before, it's that image of a peristeral short axis with a large right ventricle with high pressures that's pushing the interventricular septum in. Now we're not gonna go all to all the additional views because the FAST lecture can be a separate lecture and we have another recorded lecture that you can review for that. FASH is for focused assessment of sonography and HIV and tuberculosis is really for the low, low resource setting. Pelvic, uh, we also can, can go over as a separate topic. We have a few aortic views and a couple views of DVTs that we can review real quick. Here's another image from the um, shock uh, protocol from the International Federation of Emergency Medicine going over um, those core supplemental and then some of the additional views. Now the point of care test uh, with ultrasound for aorta and DVT are relatively quick and could be life-saving. So in the critically ill patient, it's worth knowing how to do this. For the aorta scan, we're just looking at the abdominal aorta. You can look at the root of the thoracic aorta in the peristeral long axis. But for the abdominal aorta, you start in the subxiphoid space, and then you just slide down towards the bifurcation of the aorta, which is at the umbilicus. Indicators pointing towards the patient's right. And the thing you're looking for as your sort of global marker of where the aorta is going to be is the vertebral body because it's a big bright thing. It'll shadow and the aorta always sits on top of it on the left side. You'll also see the inferior vena cava on the right side. And you don't want to confuse that for the aorta. The sub xiphoid space, you'll see the liver. And then below the liver, but between the vertebral body, you'll see a round structure that's anechoic and pulsating, that's the aorta. And we wanna see it less than three centimeters. If it's more than three centimeters, that's an aneurysm. More than five centimeters, we get start getting really worried. More than five centimeters, it's often something you'd refer to possibly have surgery or have some uh, less invasive intervention done, but it's really more the rate of change that we care about than the actual number. And this image, that's to the right of the patient, but it's on the left part of the screen, the other anechoic circle, that's the inferior vena cava. You can evaluate the aorta also in a long axis, so the indicator pointed up towards the patient's head. And here we're seeing vertebral body, it's bright in the bottom, 
and then this tube on top of it is the aorta. You can measure it along its axis. You can also use these hash marks on the side to measure the aorta. You can really tell just by looking at it sometimes if it's less than three centimeters. This is one where you can see the vertebral body and then this big circle, that whole thing's aorta. The small anechoic portion within the aorta is the lumen where the blood's flowing, the rest is sort of clotted blood. But this is an aneurysm and it's like one, two, you know, like four or five centimeters in size. Another example of a abdominal aortic aneurysm, you see the vertebral body and then this large thrombus as well as the lumen is all included when you measure these things. So this is a large aneurysm. Another one with a bunch of floating clot that looks really uh, dangerous, big AAA right here. And lastly, what we're going to talk about right now is uh, DVT studies. And really this is just to confirm your suspicion that the patient may have a pulmonary embolism. We talk about a two point compression test when we're doing this in a point of care fashion. It's really a two regional test, not point. Where well, you're looking in the region of the femoral vein and then the region of the popliteal. Because if you cover those regions, you're gonna catch the vast majority of these deep vein thromboses. So what you do is you start as high as you can in the leg of the common femoral vein and then you start scanning down basically until you lose the vein and then you go scan the popliteal region as well. So here we are um, in the sort of common femoral vein. We're seeing the saphenous vein shoot off from the femoral vein. You can see the femoral artery as well. And what we're doing is we're compressing. So we get those veins um, in a nice view and you push straight down into the patient. And if the veins compress 100%, there's no thrombus there. If they don't compress, that's how you diagnose a thrombus. Here's an example of the popliteal region. We always use the, uh, the sentence pop on top just to remember that the popliteal vein sits on top of the popliteal artery, which is the anechoic pulsatile structure below. So we're compressing this one as well, and it compresses 100%, so there's no DVT there. Another example um, in the popliteal region, if you're really not sure um, if that's the vein or the artery, you can always push harder. Here we can almost compress the artery 100%. Here's an example of a DVT in the popliteal region. You can see bone below and then um, the artery, you can see it's pulsating as we really compress that artery. And then there's this big circle thing on top. That's the vein that's not compressing. And there's a little, some intraluminal echoes in there as well. So DVT. Another example of a DVT, we have a little bit of color flow, power flow on here where we're compressing and uh, you can see that there's intraluminal echoes, it's non-compressible, there's a little bit of flow around it. All right, so that's pretty much the sonography for hypotension and cardiac arrest. Of course, of course, in cardiac arrest, uh, it'd be slightly different, but it's the same view. So let's take what we learned here, practice it in person, try to get some of these views down cold. So when you're in the heat of the moment, you can do this exam, you can make clinical decisions that will hopefully avoid PA arrest, but if you land in PA arrest, you can identify some of the reversible causes as well.